So good afternoon, evening, everybody. We're here for another panel discussion on World War II TV. And this one's going to be a, a doozy to use an American expression because we're going to talk about reenactment, living history. What exactly is it? Um, why do people do it? And I've gathered a group of people, some I know, some I don't know. Some have known an awful long time to discuss this. I've got one from Germany, two from the USA and the rest are from from Blighty. So um uh, I'm not going to do big long introductions to everybody because it's going to eat into the time really. But we'll we'll um, we'll get going with this discussion really. So um, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. So Hello. we are going to start off by talking about each of our guests. Talk about how they got into the hobby and and what units they focused on. So I'll start with Colin, my old mate Colin. So. Uh, Colin, uh, how did you get involved in the hobby? What units you've been focusing on? And okay, right. so this may be true of a lot of people, but um, school trip back in the uh, the late seventies, early eighties, we went to Belgium. We were taken to Bastogne, and we went to the Bastogne Historical Centre. And in there, at the end of the museum, there was a shop selling original World War II helmets. And it had never occurred to me before that you could actually own a piece of equipment that had been around in World War II. And that, alongside living through um, some of the classic war movie period, uh, classic culture that came out, like Warlord and Battle, all that history just built up the airfix models. And then when you discovered that you could actually buy the real stuff, well, when I started working, I found I had a bit of extra money, started having a look around. I saw an advert in a model shop for the World War II Battle Reenactment Association, who had just done their fantastic first big battle down at Molash, which was basically military vehicle club owners riding around and shooting each other with 12-gauge shotguns. Um, there was a local group. I got interested in that. Unfortunately, it was all American because that seemed to be the thing at the time. Uh, started off with the Big Red One, really into the GI, but what I found is that the own, my own na British nationality and troops of that period was something that really caught my attention. And I wanted to know more about that and understand them more following on from the stories and history that I've found. So that was my beginning. And then finding that small group that existed in Newcastle just led on to more and more things well good start so I'll, I'll go around the order i have people on my screen so i'll go to pete next so, and well then we'll do go on to greg so pete um same question you gotta unmute yourself first mate i have i have yeah I'm good oh I, I could have done that from the uh, center of the screen couldn't i so i mean my story is very similar in a way to colin um i grew up in the 80s airfix models and airfix figures and soldiers and um, action men with World War II outfits and um, battle comics, Warlord Victor, um, watching black and white films with my dad, uh, the classic war movies. And I had a massive interest, a massive interest in, in British World War II stuff. It wasn't, it, I, I, I watched it. American World War II films and all that sort of stuff, but I love John Mill film, John Mills and David Niven and and all that sort of stuff, and it, it, that just captured my imagination. So, um, you know, that's I, and I was in war games. I, I was in war games, and I went to a convention. Nerd. Uh, yeah, and uh, I met Mick Fox, who Colin will know, um, and he did East Yorkshire stuff. And as a kid, I'd picked up some bits and bobs of a of, of kit like helmets and webbing and bits and bobs. And um, Mixed Box got me interested in, in, in getting some kit together. And then I just start, and from that point on, I just started to learn and collect gear. And, 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 and really, it's just a massive interest in the history and the kit. That's me. That's how I got into it. And we'll move to Greg, because Greg, you're in the same group as as Pete um, and that I was in, Monty's men. And we also, well, Greg and I were in first air reconnaissance squadron together a few years ago. So, Greg, I mean, slightly different route to you because you came out of um, the services. But your story. Yes. So quite similar in some respects, big interest in 
military history from a young age, um, came from a military family. Um, but it was a, w- a wide range of, of interest, everything from, you know, fourth century Roman heavy cavalry all the way through to, to, to modern stuff, really. Um, but my introduction to World War II living history was I was about 15 and I saw a film on TV. I think it was called Over There. And it was about uh, a bunch of guys that were going off to a reenactment weekend up in the north of England. One of them gets shot in the face um, and has some um, brass spatter goes into his eye, temporarily blinded, and they have to leave the site. In the best traditions of reenactors everywhere, couldn't use a map, got lost. And eventually they bimbled into this group of girls camping and young men and young girls being together out in the middle of nowhere. Things happened. And I was watching this thinking, that's a fantastic film. That's the hobby for me. You know, army and girls. That's that's good. <laughs> I want to do this. Um, and so I looked around, went to the local library to see if there are any contacts. And there, there happened to be. And the local unit was 916 Grenadier Regiment, uh, which was German, uh, 352nd Division. Uh, one of the original units from good old Barnes Reduced to Ashes, as BRA became known as after a while. Uh, Colin will understand that one. And um, so I started in the German unit. And it was a fantastic time. I left, joined the armed forces. Um, and when I left the armed forces, came back, thought, I missed my reenacting. Let's see what's out there. 916 was still going, so I rejoined 916. Um, but a little while afterwards, I got invited over to First Airborne Recce and um, joined that, led that unit for a wee while, and then started Monty's Men along with Pete and a, another bunch of worthies that are well known within the UK reenactment community. Super stuff. So, um, who, who wants to go next? Neil, Neil and Steve. So, let's go with you two next. Um... Unmute yourselves. Uh, yeah, there we go. I tell you where it, it started for me. I was actually more interested in Romans. Um, so reenactment for me was, first of all, I went down a Roman route. But the background to World War II was having a, two grandfathers that spoke about the war all the time. Uh, my granddad would buy us those commando books and, you know, we'd order German phrases in there. I would say, oh, what does Zum Teufel mean? What does Donner and Blitzen mean? Um and he could speak German, so that was quite handy, we'd translate. But that led to me, so I, I was quite interested in Romans. I went down Roman reenactment originally, but I found, uh, looking for looking for a new Roman sword, um, there was an advert in um, one of the uh, gun mart for Sebrek, which was South Essex battle reenactment group. It was a very small thing, but they used to have little battles down um, near Billericke, wasn't it? It was Billericke, yeah. And uh, I couldn't drive, and I was quite interested. So I could. <laughs> he could drive, and he used to drive me down to these events and took part in them as well. I was and sat in a car for the first couple of events, yeah. just listening to bangs in the wood. <laughs> but um, it was yeah, not, it wasn't those sort of bangs, you know, mind you, could have been with some of them. But um, the thing was is that initially I did German because that was what they did, and I did SS, but I wasn't keen on the SS. Um, I started doing Falschenjäger originally um, from that because there was a guy called Rick Melville. I think some people know. And yeah, I remember Rick. I always think Rick, Rick was one of those guys, I think, who is quite forward thinking. You mean, you know, his, his phrase for us was, he's got to be authentic. He's got to be authentic. So we couldn't <laughs> use anything unless it was authentic. But he used to have a tin of beans with Bunner and Wurst printed on with a big German eagle on them. And it's a bit cookers. And it's oh. a bit cookers. Yeah, but it was all that kind of thing. So it went down that route. But the, the reason, uh, like, like everyone really, was influenced by, you know, the, the comic books, the commandos, the airfix figures with the, you know, I always think the little airfix 132 Africa core were the best figures ever. I used to adore them. So they, they looked more manly as well. But so I went down sort of like the, the German route because I was interested in the uniforms. Um, but for personal reasons, I decided I didn't want to do German anymore. Um, a lot of it was in flux in group. And I'd bought an Italian quarter shelter, um, or a Tello Tender Memetico, not Zelbarn, Tello Tender. Uh, I won't have it called a Zelbarn. Okay. And <laughs> I picked one of those up to look to sell on to Steve Kiddle, I think quite a few of us know as well. Um, but I looked at it, decided that's an interesting thing. 
I'll look into that. Started doing a bit of study on it, and that was it. And uh, fell in doing Italian. And that's where I started doing Italian, probably sort of 94, 95 is when I started doing Italian. But I'd known Paul uh, from when he was, you were doing British, yeah. I was doing Falschmäger. And we met each other, I think it's all Kentwell, wasn't it? Kentwell, that time? yeah, back in the day, yeah. Back in the day. But um, that's how I got into what I do, and that's, and he's just followed me. Oh, yeah, I just followed him, because at that point, he could drive. So yeah. it was just like two cars, <laughs> more kit. He just needed somebody to shift it. Yeah. So I just I just bimbled along on that. So, but, yeah, for me, and that is a, is a similar thing. Like I said, I used to sit in the car, listen to, like, really, you know, dodgy rave mid tunes hear all these bangs off in this wood and that, you know, and so I thought, well, while I'm here, I might as well just join in. So I turn up in a, in an Austrian spotty with a PPK and a, um, and a Spanish helmet. And that was my introduction and that very farby, but it had, it looked, the, it looked the part, but well, for an Austrian war film, but the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of like, you know, did that. And then I've literally just got equally more involved, involved, involved. And the one thing that he said with Rick Melville was that he had this thing about oh, wanting to be authentic. And that for me was the thing that really did it for me. And that was like, I've always been like really into the pocket fit and stuff like that. But that's how I got into it. And it was literally like, you know, just a brother thing. And, that. and it was just like, yeah. well, you know, why the hell not? And I actually, I really loved it because it was a bit of escapism from everything. And yeah. um, and it's been like that. And when we did the Italian, well, for want of a better word, we did a bit of giggles. Uh, and it just exploded yeah. from there. And wine. And wine. <laughs> and wine. I mean, yeah. what is it? The recruitment is like, all we do is like relax, drink, smoke and pinch ladies' bottoms. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what you need. So, yeah, that was it. That was how we got into it. So, and it's kind of just like cascaded from there. And when you did a research, you find there's a lot more involved. There's more meat and veg behind it. Well, we'll, we'll add on that later on. But I think the last of my kind of group of... Of, of East Anglians. We'll go to Nikki next because I mean, similar story, <laughs> except you're a girl, of course, but we your same background, same units. But how did you get involved? I am. Um, I think I'm going to have to take you right back to um, my primary school days. Um, when I when I was a um, small child, I actually lived with my grandparents and I was an only child. So I was brought up on kind of like war stories. Um, my grandfather was a um, gas superintendent during the war. And my grandma um, used to read the meters. And um, my grandma was a prolific smoker. And we put it, always put it down to the fact that she used to hate the smell of, uh, of the gas cupboards. And um, so she, she, used, she started smoking because she um, didn't like the smell of, of the stale gas from, from the cupboards. And my grandfather could never ever deal with the with the with the smell of the smoke. Anyway, so I so I grew up with these kind of stories that they had around um, what they did during the war. I've always been fascinated with history, and um, when I got to secondary school, um, I had the most amazing history teacher, and he's really been influential and inspirational in um, everything that I've done in terms of living history ever since. Really. Um, I had um, horses. I learned to ride when I was when I was quite small. Um, and when I left school, I trained to be a riding instructor. And I kind of combined my love of, of sort of horses and agriculture and stuff with my love of history. Um, I was part of a medieval jousting team um, for many years. And and, um, and then in my sort of mid late twenties, I met um, Nick, who's now my husband, um, and he was into um, Second World War living history. So for me, it was a bit of a, um, a natural link, really, into going into doing something. And of course, the only thing that I was going to be interested in was Women's Land Army. So that's what I've done ever since. Um, I used to do a lot of reenactment um, in terms of um, Women's Land Army um, living history. Um, I coordinated a, um, a living history group called the Soil Cinderella's, of which I still operate under that name, but not in quite the same way. Um, we did events all over the place. We had um, a, a hardcore group of about 20 of us across the country that we used to get together and do various different events. And I think being a female in the living history space um, was really quite um, um, an opportunity for, for us to be able to do work in our own right rather than be attached to another yeah. living group of where it might have been um, a group of men because obviously Land Army is a, is a purely female activity. Um, we were very lucky doing that, that we 
got the attention of quite a lot of high profile organizations. So I was very lucky to be invited to do to take part in some really high profile events, which was lovely. Um, and I always felt ever so slightly guilty about doing that because actually my, <laughs> my poor old husband had, had done living history since he was kind of in his teens. And he just never got the kind of recognition that we did. We'd always get phone calls to do things. So I did things for um, all the Queen's horses um, the, in, in the Golden Jubilee for the Queen. I did the Queen Mother's 100th birthday parade representing the Women's Land Army. I've done things for the 65th anniversary of D-Day in St. James's Park. Um, so I just happened to be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing, I think, that stood out. Um, nowadays, I, I don't do um, reenactment um, because I'm too old to be credible in, in the Land Army. Um, so I tend to do more living history um, stuff of where I am if I do wear the uniform, I'm usually talking about it and demonstrating it whilst I'm whilst I'm talking and educating people about it, rather than being out there in the middle of a field doing the ploughing. Um, although the Lawrence twins will actually remember me doing a fair bit of that. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I think it, it appeals to my sense the, the control freaky part of me, um, wanting to pay attention to detail, and I am always on a constant mission to bust the myths that they have around um, land girls and what they did and it was a bit of fun um, and I'm certainly keen on making sure that people pay attention to detail with things like the uniform um, and I think it's my responsibility to actually make sure that the um, the work of the Women's Land Army is is not only not forgotten because it, it you know it, it it hasn't had a good press always it hasn't been at the top of people's thoughts because it isn't it hasn't been very sexy and it's not <clears> very fun um, but I really do think that there is a um, the role to be played in making sure that people actually understand what the organisation was really about. Mm. That's me. Mm. I mean, we can touch on that later on about the, the purpose of, of living history, but that, that's kind of my old mates done. So let's bring in the people I don't know quite as well from Facebook. So, so Vinny, our German, we're bringing our German now, and you do American, Rina, but is, your story is going to be broadly similar, but tell us how you got involved. Well, uh, I always had a keen interest in history, especially World War II history. And both of my grandfathers served in the Wehrmacht during World War II. And uh, one of my grandfathers was a civil contractor for the British Rhine Army after World War II in Rheindalen HQ. And so I actually grew up with British and American servicemen all around me. And I think it was 2007 or 2008, I was working for Australian company Scenic Tours on night shift and what people do on night shift, I was hanging in front of the computer and I saw a video about World War II reenactment in the United States. And I was like, oh, this looks interesting. I already started to collect a couple of years prior to that. And so I was like, okay, Google, show me if there's something similar in Germany. Is this even possible to do World War II reenactment in Germany? I mean, we Germans, we have a very difficult uh, connection to our own history. That's why we uh, nowadays have a lot of problems with right wing uh, uh, parties in our uh, country. So I Googled and I found a forum called uh, World War II reenactment something, whatever. And I was like, yeah, it's actually the same thing that the people in the United States do. It is what I would like to do. So I signed up uh, in this forum and uh, got involved and met people. And I started out with a, a very fairly large group in Germany, which had uh, 20 members back then, because the, the whole German scene is actually quite small. We maybe have like two or 300 people who do World War II. There are a lot more reenactors who do different times, Romans and Napoleon or whatever, but World War II, it's maybe 200 or 300. So I started with this rather large group uh, called the Tough Umbres. They were uh, representing the 19th Infantry Division. But um, after that, my focus shifted a little bit and uh, I left the group and I opened up my own group and we focused uh, mainly on uh, 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment fighting Fox Company back then. Then we shifted uh, to the 1st Infantry Division 
And nowadays we actually look when we are at a specific place that we try to represent the uh, specific unit that was fighting in that area. But uh, with getting ball, uh, I'm changing my focus a little bit to something that is more appropriate uh, for my age and my weight and everything. And uh, so right now I'm focusing more on a, a signal still photographer of a, a photographic unit of the signal course. But that is basically how I got involved in World War II reenactment or living history. And that's going to be something that's going to come up later on, the age appropriateness and what you do when you start getting old and what you do when you start piling on the pounds. But let's bring in our last two guests. I'm sorry it's taken so long to get to you. We'll go to Nelly first. Um, so you're, you're, you're somewhat younger, I think, than, than, than some of us senior members here. But how did you get involved and, and uh, to tell us a bit about your background? Um, so basically, um, I, w I started getting an interest um, probably as a teenager. Um, again, I had a great history teacher and we, we kind of focused on the, the Second World War. Um, so ever since, ever since, you know, about, about 14, 15, um, we started looking at the German history, the, the American and the British history. Um, so that kind of got me started into that. And it, and it wasn't until, oh gosh, I was about 25 at the time. Um, so that's quite a few years back now. Um, I heard that there was an event in Cornwall. Um, and it was um, unfortunately um, like a railway event, but we, oh, I went along with a friend. Um, we managed to go to the charity shops. I managed to get a dress. Um, don't know how, but we managed to get my friend um, a British battle dress, which was brought down from the, the charity shop down, down the stairs. Great. So we, we brought to a dance and, and then we obviously um, went to the dance, had a great time, met some really lovely, genuine people. Um, and the next day we actually went on to the railway. And then it kind of started there for a couple of years, um, for about two years. Then obviously I got involved with some local groups around the area. But we, we then started moving um, further up the line. So we, we would go up to the bigger events. And I, I fell in actually with a, a German group to start off with. Um, so I did the uh, DRK nurse. Um, I was with them for about four years. And, and unfortunately the group kind of, um, it kind of fell apart. Um, so I carried on going to different events with friends. Um, and then I met Stuart and we, he, at the time he was doing um, American, which then got me interested. We started doing um, a lot of historical like weekend trips away and, and we looked um, at the air forces so US Army Air Force and um, we were going up a lot to like Norfolk those areas um, so that kind of got my interest and especially with the the women side of the Americans so uh, the women's army corps or the, the WAC as well um, and ever since that's been it um, I've, I've started collecting um, I started off with a tunic um, a reproduction skirt, uh, a shirt, and then I have my um, garrison, and that's been it. So, kind of, my aim has been, which, which I'm nearly there, um, has to been to collect a whole, um, a whole kit, or a, all the uniform, the kit, personal items, um, handbags, shoes, etc., to what the the WAC would have been issued with when they actually enrolled. Superb. So we've just got Jared and Thomas to go in it. So who who wants to go in? Actually, we've lost Jared, I think. Have we lost Jared? No, Jared's still there. So we'll go with Jared, then we'll, we'll bring you in at the last minute, Thomas. So sorry for waiting, but, but Jared, your, your turn next. So I, you, you've done some of my shows from a history point of view, but reenactment is something. And so how did you get involved? And um... I've, uh, I've been interested in history ever since I was very little. But when I was in college uh, gaining my history degree, uh, there were a number of uh, fellow students and I who were very close knit. Uh, one of them had been involved in reenacting since he was a teenager. And slowly but surely, he reeled the rest of us uh, into the hobby as well. So I've been doing it for uh, about a decade. And for the majority of that time, uh, I've been uh, portraying a, a soldier in the U.S. 4th Infantry uh, Division. And uh, like many of our other guests here today, um, I have a family connection to that. My grandfather served in the 4th Infantry Division. 
Uh, he came ashore on Utah Beach on D-Day and was with that unit throughout the entirety uh, of the war. Uh, I have, uh, my other grandfather was in the United States Navy serving in the South Pacific, and uh, that uh, ultimately encouraged me to start a naval impression uh, as well. And, you know, my grandfathers died when I was uh, five and eight. And, you know, it, it's one of the great regrets of my life that I never had the chance to talk with them more in person uh, about their experiences as, as I aged. Um, and so, living history beyond any of the, the uh, leisurely or educational elements of it, um, it allows me to connect with the grandfathers that I never really got to know in the manner that I wish to. Uh, and so that, that's one of the underlying reasons uh, why I do the hobby. Superb. Nice and short and sweet. So, Thomas, we'll go do that. Then we'll move on to the, the, the more pertinent questions. So, Thomas, how did you get involved? Uh, it started with my grandfather. Fairly typical story. Uh, he was a Bren gunner with a second Essex and he landed on Cold Beach. When I was a kid, I used to spend a lot of time with him. Uh, and one of the things that I really developed an interest in is basically how different armies of different nations approach the same problem, but from completely opposite ends. Basically how to equip soldiers. And one of the more fascinating ones I found was a story that isn't often told in the UK is mainly about the Red Army. And I started to develop an interest in that. I also like myth busting. And there's just so many myths with the Red Army. I thought, I'll give that a go. Um, courtesy mainly of Enemy at the Gates. And it started off from there. Um, there aren't many of us in the UK who actually do it. So there is that aspect of it as well. But um, many, many, many thousands of pounds later, here we are. Yeah, you're our only our Russian delegate, so that's fantastic. So um, we've all done our introductions, so we're now moving to the kind of meat of the, of the subject. So the question is going to be, what is World War II reenactment, and what is the difference between it and living history, if there is a difference? And I, when I was doing the hobby, I wasn't really sure what the difference is. We don't all have to answer that one, but Neil, you said you did have a definition for that, didn't you? So, And then we'll ask other people. So reenactment, living history, what, what's the... I don't think... I don't think what we do as a hobby is either. We, if you think about how the hobby is constructed in this country at the moment, um, certainly in, in the UK, I'm not sure, you know, I've seen photographs of the continent and the US, but really what, what battle are we reenacting? They tend to be generic ones. I mean, you see the big displays, aren't they? And they will say, oh, it's Normandy, 1944. And, uh, here come the, the French resistance, first of all. Yeah, and, and yeah. you know, some people in some waistcoats and flat caps with red scars around the neck and a couple of Sten guns. But so for re battle, reenactment, we're not reenacting anything apart from we are recreating a historical unit. Living history has always been a bit of a crux with me because when you go around if you're going to be and you do see some groups you know you've we, we've all been to Kenwell Hall but well I say we all but most of us that, that live locally to it have been to Kenwell Hall and seen how they do their historical reenactment where they do the Tudor times it's all very good they, they play in the person and there are plenty of people who do play in the first person um, but when it comes to living history in World War Two, it's, it's, it's too difficult to do. The whole point is, is that, you know, when we're out, we're displaying uniforms and equipment. But, you, you know, you don't, when you go to walk past these displays, they'll be in their full combat gear, you know, either US Airborne or British Infantry um, or Soviet, Soviet Marine. And they'll be in their full <laughs> combat gear. But that's, it's, it's not that's not living history for me because that's just showing a uniform of a, a sorry, a particular action. It's a living display. It's yeah. a living display. I always believe, I always feel that we're more like um, historical recreational educators. That's how I've always seen what we do. And, and I speak for myself and what we do in my group, um, Mediterranean. And we're, you know, we, we have, 
we have people coming up there and we'll be dressed in the uniforms as they would have been worn, i.e. it's so like, you know, take for example, Russian Front. So we'll do so like the Alpini of the Tridentina division. We'll be in the uniforms as they wore. But, you know, we're not recreating a battle. We're not speaking Italian and we're not so like waiting for the mail from the way home. We're not, you know, we're not desperately short of food. We're not so like waiting for the Russians to come and so like pound the living hell out of us. You know, it's we're not recreating anything. And this is the thing. This is where I always get stuck with living history. Living history would be for me to speak Italian, um, be 30 years younger and, um, you know, be be in fear of what the next minute's going to bring. That's yeah. why I always feel like so living, living history for me is kind of a misdemeanor. I don't think it's an accurate thing. I, I think that we are just uniformed or historically uniformed educators that's how i see what actually the entire scene is i don't know what other people's take on that is. yeah uh, who, who else wants to come in on this who else has got an interpretation of reenactment <clears throat> living history anyone nikki yeah i've got one well, well, well let's do nikki first then we'll do you yep. yeah so nikki <laughs> i have to say i i, I there are parts of what steve has just said that i completely agree neil with. neil 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 neil, neil. <laughs> oh you both look the same even now um so i think for me that the you know, is, is more of a, a, a title for an activity of where you are immersing yourself in uh, a, a snapshot of time and you are um living walking in those shoes and recreating so it's the same kind of word that 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 you know has just been mentioned um, but you are undertaking a, in the activity in the manner that the person might have done. You're, you're doing the same sort of thing. You are behaving in the same sort of way. So for me, um, I, I could give an example of um, doing um, reenactment for me in terms of land army. And I could be out in the middle of the field with a pair of horses and I could be um, ploughing the field or I could be you know riding on a tractor plowing up a field for me that's a reenactment because that's exactly what would have happened um and whether i make a good job of it or not is is, is probably you know an, a, another thing um but if i've got the skills to be able to do that and i've got the resources to be able to do that then for me that's reenactment mm. um, because i would be giving people a view if they're watching a snapshot of, of how it was and i would be acting in the same way if I did the same activity as a living historian, I would far more likely be giving a commentary on what I'm doing at the same time. So, um, or I would be talking to people before it, during it and after it about this is, this is what they would have done. This is how they would have done it. These are the kind of things that they would use. So for me, I, I, I look at myself and, and I call my, and I refer to myself as a living historian um, because I don't do reenactment. So yeah, I think everybody's situations are going to be yeah. very different. But let's bring let's bring Pete in. Then I think Greg wants to say so. Pete, is your is your opinion the same or different? Or yeah, I should be unmuted now. Um, I, I I think I think things have changed so quickly in the last sort of you know twenty twenty odd years. I mean, it, it sounds like a long time, but it was reenactment when I joined it and then, and then people sort of moved to the words living history and, and that might have been a, a half an attempt to legitimize themselves further. And I mean, a lot of it's about the history and the interest in the kit. Um, how individuals portray themselves or how individuals uh, demonstrate their stuff or how individuals um, involve themselves in their hobby can define how how they want the words to be used about yeah what describes them some people describe themselves now as visual storytellers i mean that, that's a new one on me i don't know what that means um i've heard people talk about stuff that we've done in monty's men as experimental archaeology that's not words i've used wow because we're using we're using original kit petrol cookers that people kept for years that didn't work we've got them working again and then we're cooking food on them you know all that sort of stuff we're using this kit and that technology and that time to live and that's what one of these men is you know it's not 
we don't do public shows. We don't. It's it's about the participants in that event all contributing to an experience. Um, and and you know then then you you go across to public shows and you go across to different things like that and and different things at different time things at different times depending on what you're doing and how you train yourself. So mm-hmm. I think I think everyone's definition of what they do is different depending on their interest or how they portray it at the event they're in at the time. So I, I, I don't want to take up any more time. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's why, and I'll put it on me for a second, I think that's why, I mean, I, I, as you know, some of you, I was a reenactor, I was living, whatever classification you want to call it, and uh, then I moved to Normandy, couldn't get back the events, so I did a couple of years, and I just gave it up and knocked it on the head in 2004. And I live in Normandy where the quality of the reenactment living history is just absolute complete shit, generally. There's some good stuff, but it is completely obscured by the shit. The, the, the parades here, like a circus of effluence every June, except this year. And so I I find it hard to justify the good of it because I see such absolute crap now. Um, and I think that's where the public don't understand what it's like. If we can't, if I, if I include myself as a reenactor temporarily for tonight, if we can't define the hobby ourselves, how the hell can the public actually understand what we're tr- they're trying to do as well? That that's where I yes. think the confusion comes. So, Greg, you wanted to make a point here, and then well, anyone else wants to add on this? And Nelly, I think does well. Go to Greg, then Nelly. Okay, so it was a very quick picking up on something that Pete said, um, and Colin will probably remember this as well. A number of years ago, World War Two BRA changed its name to World War Two LHA, and that that came around about the time where Narrows was starting to get um, quite influential and. Stuff like Kirby Hall was kicking off. Yeah. And World War II reenacting was seen to be the poor bastard child of reenactment. You weren't the English Civil War. You weren't Romans. You had no validity or legitimacy because you weren't proper history. And that was one of the issues that we had. And so by calling ourselves living historians, it was a, a just a semantical way of giving ourselves legitimacy with the rest of the, you know, the yeah. reenactment, because that's what it sort of is. That, with the rest of that community and trying to pull us into being treated with equality with English Civil War Society, SOSCAN, you know, the, uh, Ermine Street Guard, all those sorts of groups. So I, I don't think it was a, a big change between what we do. You can have, you know, you can get into a semantical stuff around, well, reenactment is a specific unit, a spe- specific action in a specific campaign at a specific time. And then living history is a generic interpretation of, how things happened at that point in time. This is the clothing and equipment and the tactics and the overall strategic situation around that period. But fundamentally, and this will probably annoy a lot of people, it is just dress up at the end of the day. Now, how seriously you take the dressing up, that's that's a different question. And I think that'll speak to the point that you're going to try and make later mm. about quality of kit and, and interpretation and knowledge and all those sorts of things. Well, I'm glad someone just admitted it is just dressing up because, I mean, I remember years ago on one of those old forums, I'll bring to Nelly in, Nelly in a minute, there was a, something about why do we do it? And me and Johnny Hayworth were saying, well, we do it because we enjoy it. I mean, we can pretend it's about educating and all this, but actually we wouldn't go and get muddy and sit in fields and do that if we didn't enjoy it. So sometimes we kind of try and find a reason to justify. But Nelly, you wanted to add something on this one, then, then we can, you know, we'll, so what was your reaction? Reenactment, living history, what's the difference? Oh, yep. I'm on mute it now. Yep. Now, your comment just made me laugh because sometimes if I think about what we do too much, it is basically dress up, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it, yeah, so it does make me giggle. And if you say to people, like, well, when I'm at work, I work at school, what I do, they're like, well, you dress up and sit in a field. And you, you kind of go, well, it's not. And you try, you justify it. But in yeah, it's not to, to everyday people. That's what they think. Um saying about in in my head it's really difficult because like you said you've got reenactors and you've got living living historians and and it depends what people take on that to, to you know the how they define it um but to, to me like um like you said a living historian is is someone more that tries to portray it as accurately as possible um but but they're also um when, when they're doing it that they're, they're trying to educate the public so yeah you're right so you know if, if we've got a display on it is, you know, we, we do it as ac- accurately correct as we can with the original kit, but then we're talking to the people. So 
we're not actually like like you said you know we're not them we haven't got the accent or we're not playing it it's more like we're trying to um educate the public which is great however when you say about educating the public you could have an authentic display which you know down to a detail of a photograph looks exactly the same but you could have a display opposite that that kind of yeah that that kind of looks um great and you, you might have some oh, I, don't, I don't know um, I don't want to think of any I can't think of any but you know you might have someone there um they, they might look amazing they might have flowers in their hair they might have a, a uniform on and whatever and and the public will go oh that's what they used to look like so it is yeah it, it is difficult to, to 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 try and I think I think what people are doing is trying to separate themselves saying that that you know I'm a, a living historian I spend hours of research on this because I want to get it right. Um, but I'm sure we'll go into this a, a bit further. But it is, um, it's, it's what people take on it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it gets very complicated. Like, you know, when, we'll, we'll rope it up in a minute. But when, I mean, a, a, in World War II films, people wear uniforms, but the purpose is to create a 90-minute movie that entertains and that it's, it's encapsulated within that format, isn't it? Um, I remember the lot well, of the last events I did at Kirby Hall, whichever year, when we had the, the recce group and Vera were there in the in the wood. And that's kind of how I got involved in the guy in a weird way, because we decided to tell people it is September the 19th or something at Arnhem. And we walked people through and we didn't explain the kit. We explained the historical significance. We said the Germans are over there. We don't we're holding the drop zone and we tried to take people through in little groups. We didn't let them get into the, the conversation with the public saying, What's that gun there, mate? We didn't do that. We led them through, showing here's the mortar position, here's the machine gun position, and then we led them out after a half an hour walkthrough, and that worked really well. And to me, that was that was kind of verging on living history. But um, it, it, it dovetails neatly now into the next question of um, when people say, "Isn't it just dressing up?" Which we touched on, and why don't you just go join the army, mate? All that kind of stuff. I mean, what? Why don't we just join the army? What What do you, when, I mean, I know some people have served, but what, what's the response to that? Anyone want to sort of, how do you respond to those questions you get from the public uh, about, you know, why don't you just join the army or isn't it just dress up? What do you, what's your response to that? Anyone? The modern, ar the modern army won't let us drive Sherman tanks for a start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Or, I mean, or, or not shrink your berry. Yeah. yeah. Oh God, don't I, give tr I tried that and then it got put into a bucket of gold water. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, anyone, anyone want to tackle that? I mean, why don't you just join the army? I mean, are there, are there, or are there other questions you get asked that you hate and you don't know how to answer them? What 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 are the ones that put, are, are we worded differently? What are the ones yeah, that Paul. you don't know how to answer? You, you, you get put on a spot and you really don't know how to justify it. Paul, I've got an answer for that. Right. <clears throat> um, from my point of view on that, or, you know, it's uh, you just might not be medically fit to join the armed forces. Um, you could have like, you know, like a condition like asthma or something like that, which would actually like, negate your, your chance to actually go and do yeah. military service. And that's it. Um, so really, on that, I mean, you know, I mean, the answer is, he goes, well, why don't you join the army? Because like, I don't want to get shot. Um, but the, the real answer to that is, is, um, you may not actually be physically fit. I mean, you, when you look at a vast percentage of reenactors and stuff like that, some of them are, you know, they're, 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 they're experiencing something that possibly that they want to do, but they can't because of conditions. You know, if you're going to have like, you know, some sort of cardiac myopathy or something like that, you can still reenact, but you know, there's no way you're going to do an assault course. No. It's just not going to be viable on that. I mean, you, you wouldn't even like, you know, some people can't even get up to like, you know, like you said, you know, like, you know, for you, it's like a, you know, it's like, um, you know, a victory for you getting your socks on in the morning and that. Yeah. Uh, Without some people, they're, they're like that in their yeah. teens and their twenties. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like them being able to express themselves, but in a way that's actually safe. If that makes sense, you know, I've got utter respect and for all people who've done military service and all serving members of the armed forces. They had my, utmost uh respect and devotion they are fantastic members of society yeah there to protect us but there are some members of society who want to do this but the way of expressing it is to dress up but then if, if i'm gonna I put a tough and i'll open up again if the, to the top que tough question again is if we all know these people exist if a 65 year old rather obese guy goes to a school dressed in uniform and tells people here's what it was like kids and his kids are perfect his knowledge of the, everything is perfect and explains gas masks 
is that person not giving those kids a, a flawed idea of who fought those wars? Because the wars weren't fought by 60 plus year old guys with, you know, 48, 48 inch waist. Is, is that not doing a disservice? I'm, I'm not saying I, I think, necessarily agree with that. I'm just throwing uh, it out yeah. there. No, that, 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 I'm with you there, Woody. As, a, as an aged reenactor, uh, yeah, I've stepped back from doing front line. Um, and I think people have to be self-governing and say, right, I can present uniform, take a mannequin, take it that way and display it. But you can't say, here I am, I'm 60 plus, I've got this belly. I'm not a frontline soldier. At the best, I might have been a home guardsman. Age relevant for your interpretation. That's got to be um, a really important thing to present. Otherwise, like you say, you're misleading the public and you're possibly making a mockery of yourself and the hobby and the people you're trying to represent. I mean, you were part of the, the Khaki Chums, uh, uh, famously, or still are. When I mean, the Khaki Chums officially decided to not wear the, the, the uniform was anymore, they were going to just be, you know, we've, we've got too old, we're not going to recruit again, and they just stopped. And you all, people like Taff Gillingham, who people watching this will be know, know from his, his advice on movies, you're still firmly involved in the, the explanation of military history, but not through the medium of wearing uniforms. And to me, that well done for making that decision, because there are people I know who, have, who were old when I was doing it, and they're still doing it. And I, I gave up at 34 years old, and I thought I was pushing it then because I was a bit, a bit cuddlier than I'd like to have been. And, you know, so... We can touch on that later on about the age appropriateness and what have you, but um, the, the, anyone else want to answer what, what they say to awkward questions they get? Vinny, you've, you've got to react. And, and from Germany, I think you're going to get more uh, weird questions than we're going to get. Um, of course. But I have one more thing about the, the, the age, weight, and whatever discussion, because that comes up pretty often. And if we would have just young kids in the reenactment scene that would be wonderful but those kids they don't uh have a good wage they don't uh the hobby is actually based on middle-aged men and women because they have the spare time they have the knowledge and they yeah, your have audio the is money breaking up a bit Vinny. to We're invest gonna and I your audio is really bad. We'll hold you. We'll try and bring you back in a minute. But yeah, um, it, it's breaking up for me. Oh. Um, Jared, because you, you you teach people, don't you? Actually, yeah. you are an educator and an author as well. So I mean, what's your take on the you know the the awkwardness of the hobby and and the ageness? I mean, the age issues. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this issue rests in what certain reenactors' motives are. Um, you know, I, I think in many ways it goes beyond whether or not someone is fit or unfit for military service. Some people just like to tell stories and they like to get in touch with history. And there are many mediums in which one can do that. Um, and uh, living history is, is a, a very prominent uh, version of all of that. And, um, you know, to go back to with, uh, what one of our colleagues said here, um, you know, I think as long, you know, if you are older, if you are talking about the common soldier experience, I think as long as you draw that line of separation, you know, in, in discussing, you know, I, you know, I do not fit that category, but I can talk to you about the people who did. And I think um, with, with young people in particular, um, if the presenter is, is older or doesn't fit the, the demographic of a, a common soldier, uh, that's where you have the opportunity to pull in young people. Let the young people try on the equipment. Let them be mm. the model for display. And I think in a lot of ways, that will make it even more engaging and more memorable for those younger demographics. And just to quickly tie that in with what was previously discussed on living history versus reenactment, I have always thought of reenactment as a venue or an event in which visitors are spectators, whereas living history is an event or venue where they are participants in one form or another. 
Right. Uh, and I think in so many regards, some of the best of the living history events are ones that can create an immersive environment and ones that allow for a certain degree of interactiveness uh, among those people who come and talk to us. Which on Lassa Rare, I mean, Colin, we'll bring you in. And I liked your point about it being self-governing. But given that we're in the middle of the bloody COVID-19 epidemic, self-governing doesn't fucking work, does it? Because if self-governing worked, we wouldn't have all these issues of everyone doing exactly what they want to do. You could advise people. So we, you know, there, there was that reenactor charter, the couple of years, Helen Patton, General Patton's granddaughter, who I know very well, Helen's the best man, I spoke to her yesterday. And she had this charter, it's a great idea, but if people don't want to sign it, what you can't stop them. You can't stop people turning up wearing 101st Airborne uniform when they're 73 years old. You can't stop it. So Colin, you know, you wanted to make a point about the, you know, joining the army. So, um, yeah. yeah uh, it kind of follows on from what Pete said. And um, a fellow, reenactor Dickie Ingram he said this uh, many years ago why don't people why don't you join the army I said well I don't want to join the modern army the modern army is very different to the army in history that we're trying to recreate um, and I think that's the crucial difference that you know some of us I know a lot of friends have gone on being successful soldiers officers and come back into the hobby or even never even left the hobby and carry both on set side by side. But a lot of us don't want to be in that particular modern situation. It's a situation that we mm. prefer, perhaps rose tinted, but I would have thought that the majority of us have done enough research to know that them rose tinted glasses have got cracks in them and experience that life in the army, which is very different to today's. But I would say just quickly as well, I think that the research and knowledge and history that I've picked up has become very useful to talking to ex-servicemen and helping them, having an understanding from a civilian point of view about what an active serviceman goes through. Uh, yeah. that's, I've found that to be a benefit. I mean, I don't want to talk about me, but in my career now and what I do, my reenactment background, I'm embarrassed in some ways as being a reenactor because when I, people say, my mag mother half says, did you used to do that? And she points at this shit and all I go, yeah, well, kind of, but not like that, I'd like to think. But at the same time, it's given me the ability to be able to talk to veterans. And when you, when you know you want to bring up some bloody battle they're involved in, you bring it in by going in via 24-hour ration packs first or something. You try and get a, a sense of um a relationship with them by talking about the itchiness of battle dress or surge or whatever and then you kind of slip in the battle stuff there so it's provided me with an ability to engage them that if i had just read books about battles i wouldn't be able to do so that's a benefit it brought me but we're coming up now to this what benefit does it bring to live to the general public and again i'm going to use normandy as a reference and because i i'm going to maintain that in normandy living history doesn't bring really much benefit at all to the public all they just see is more jeeps than i imagine were ever produced full of overweight uh paratroopers with beards and and shoulder holsters and 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 ray bands and the whole lot there and i don't know that that really provides much and yet within that there are some very good displays going on that no one sees because they're stuck behind a museum in fox cells and no one sees that but they do see the parade of jeeps going past it you know with the sirens blazing and the you know so what 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 does living history bring to or what rather what would you like living history to give to the public and perhaps more honestly what does it actually bring the public what what would you what should it bring the public what it right quickly i'll just jump okay colin then, then what it should bring in is what you mentioned earlier about kirby hall that immersive experience where you're trying to show people how people lived acted not the one we discussed before where you have a table with, I've got Brennan sustain fire fixed here. I've got me windy up gramophone and I've got me pop tent and this is how people lived. No, it, it has to be a little bit more involved. And we've both been involved in, in Monty's men and the khaki chums uh, and more immersive events. And I think those, when the public are watching, give them more of an understanding rather than what we started off doing, which was where, the, uh, the Germans attacked the far end of the football pitch and the Americans sheltered behind three hay bales, which were bulletproof. 
<laughs> you had three. You were lucky. We only had two in Essex. <laughs> two? Oh, two hail bales. Well, I say two. <laughs> it was two to us. <laughs> just, just make sure you put the Brenga next to the bouncy castle as well, Colin, because it's got the best field of fire. Yeah. And you can leave the barrel against it and melt it. But I mean, at its best to me, you know, you that Tooley, Tooley Street Blitz experience in London, where you walk through and you're transported back to the Blitz in 1940. At its best, that's what living history should do, where the public are walking into an environment where they're getting the sights and smells and, and sensation of being there. That's what it should should be. But how often does it realistically hit those heights? That's who wants to take it on. I mean, Pete, you might, well, Pete and Greg, uh, for those who are watching, that the Monty's men, well, you hinted at it earlier on, Pete, you don't make your events open to the public at all. You don't even have a big, like, Facebook page. You don't put videos out. I've, I nicked a couple of photos no. for Twitter feeling bad about it, but you don't even make what you do available to the public. So, well, I think this is, you, this, what, my this is all about just admitting to ourselves. I think uh, why we're interested in the hobby, you know. So people say, "Well, you know, is it dressing up?" Well, to a degree, yeah, it is. And, and is it is it is it indulging ourselves in our own hobby? Yes, it is. So when you look, it, I might generalise a bit here, and if I'm out of order, then somebody can correct me. But so let's say it's 1970 something or other, before my time, and you're interested in World War Two, and and you've got some other friends who are interested in World War Two, and then you form the about reenactment association bra and then you have events and those events are to get you together and you get some money from some of those events but those are that 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 money pays for you to go to those events and to be with your friends to indulge yourself in your hobby and then the whole thing becomes this vicious cycle of going to events and paying for other paying for the I don't know, public liability insurance for the organization for you to do your hobby and to go away and to sort of semi-legitimize yourselves and don't get me wrong, there's some people who do some incredible work in, in trying to, you know, um, educate the public and keep everything up, you know. And, and I've done all that. I have done all of that. And so has Greg. He's done all that too. And, you know, Tom Jones, he does a lot of that. He's myth busting and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of the guys here have done all that too, you know. So... But with Monty's men, I think we said, you know, Greg said the Bren gun next to the Bouncy Castle or an OP in the big wheel. Um, and uh, you, you get a bit sick of that. And we decided to do things for ourselves. And we did things for ourselves, but we did things in France for ourselves in areas of France that were off, that, that weren't part of the big circus. It wasn't Gold Beach, yeah, it wasn't yeah, Shore yeah. Beach, it wasn't Juno Beach. It was inland. It may have only been inland five miles, but nobody, nobody apart from some battlefield tours had ever, ever been there. So some aged officers in the 1960s and 70s had been there with some battle school tours and some Santa tours <laughs> might have been there. But nobody else had been there. And that's what we did. We went back, we went back with 50, 60 men, you know, in the kit as the unit that was there at that time on that exact day 50, 60 years before. Then we went back and we did that. That's what was Monty's Men was all about. Battlefield tours, education for the participants, a spectacle for the local inhabitants that weren't on Gold Beach, that weren't on Saw Beach, that weren't on Omaha Beach. And, and that takes nothing away from the men who dropped on, you know, the 501st, or, you know, the, you know, 101st Airborne, 82nd Airborne, 6th Airborne, the commandos. It takes nothing away from all that. It's all about infantry. It's all about the foot sluggers. And it was, a, it was about saying, well, hold on a minute. It was on the front line 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the month, until from they landed to the end of the war. What were their casualty rates? And, and it, 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 it was a bit of a principle and and so we might have taken it over for ourselves and we might have been refocused in the last couple of years and going to events in the UK, but that's legislation based because yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. we're out of our hands. Before that, it was all about saying, right, well, we're going to go to this tiny village where 250 men, 300 men were casualties from a battalion, from a county regiment that was amalgamated 30, 40, 50 years ago. In, in, and 
we're going to do that unit, and then after that, we're going to do that unit. And it's just, so anyway, sorry, I'm rambling. No, but, well, yeah. I mean, essentially what you're saying is you're doing it to educate yourselves, not the public. And I think that's actually very honest. In a sense, pointless. I'm putting that out there. Not pointless, but you're educating yourselves. But then there isn't this idea of educating the wider public. I mean, Greg, you were the one who put the Monty's men together. Then we'll bring other people in. But you, you had it was kind of your concept. And you know, Pete, you know, encapsulated it very well there. But you, you don't have the public there. It's all about you. But you, you obviously, as a group, and I did a couple of Monty's men events back in the day. You come out of it having learned something. But if there's no wider recognition, what's it all about? What's the point? But there's a, a couple of points that I'd, I'd like to bring up with regard to that. So the reason we did it ourselves is that, and potentially Colin will remember this from the BRA days, is as soon as you had to start doing shows because they paid, and in, allegedly they paid for your group insurance for the year, rather than just raising the membership fee so we could do the events that we as an association wanted to do, we now had to do these you know i think the phrase was donkey derbies and all these sorts yeah, of things yeah. so we were forced commercially into attending these shows that nobody wanted to do because there was no historical relevance to them there was no real interest from the public but we had to do them and that led to a lot of bad feeling within the association that why are we doing this show and unfortunately railway events came in for a lot of stick for this for many good reasons and possibly some very poor reasons. But it was, I don't want to do these shows anymore. I'm getting nothing out of it. The public's getting nothing out of it. And the association is hurting itself by doing them. And so we looked at it as airborne recce in reality and said, this is stupid. It's costing us a fortune to do these. And nobody, nobody is benefiting from it. The public could turn up and go, oh, German helmet, German helmet, German helmet. And it didn't matter if it was 916 Regiment, Falsham Jaeger, maybe a wrong case there, but or or SS or whatever. And they go, British helmet, British helmet, British helmet. And it, it, that was as far as it got. Nobody learned anything. And so we sort of said, look, th this is ridiculous. We're wasting our time. We're wasting our money. We're not enjoying it. And it's a fantastic hobby. Despite you know, the potential niggles that we all have with it, it's a brilliant hobby. And we're at the point where it was, right, I either stop doing this hobby that I really enjoy or I just suck it up and stop whinging. And we're all control freaks that do this, this hobby. We're all detail orientated. We all don't want to be told what to do. And so don't look at me like that, Colin. You know it's true. Um, and so we said, right, we're going to do it for ourselves. And that's when we came up with the concept of, sod this no public shows no public because it doesn't add anything and if we're honest we do this for ourselves the number of times i've had people try to justify their hobby as i do it for the veterans i do it for education i do it for x no you do it because you enjoy it so admit that to yourself first and foremost and then you've got a healthy basis for progressing and so we said right we're doing this for ourselves and this is what we want to do. We don't want to dig in next to the candy floss machine. We want to dig in in a tree line in Normandy. The association didn't offer us that opportunity. So we had to make that opportunity ourselves. No show organizer was going to pay for us to really dig in, camouflage up and live rooting in defense at a public show. They just wouldn't pay for it because nobody would see it. You'd see a bunch of Tommy helmets just below the line of um, slit trenches and lots of farting noises and tea being drunk. That's nobody commercially is going to wear that. Mm. And so it was a case of, I ain't doing this anymore. It's stupid. Yeah. So I mean, John Prince just said on YouTube, who's another member of it, uh, technically there are public present because the participants themselves are the public. So there's no other public, but the, the participants themselves and your, your company, you had 160 or something last year for the, or the, the last Monty's Men. So, I mean, it was nearly a full company uh, you fielded, which was impressive. And I nearly was tempted to get out some hot nails and hop over the channel and join you, but uh, always welcome Woody. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that bus has, has that bus has gone, but you know, the point is, you know, it, it, it is, you are being honest. So anyone else got any opinions on this whole, you know, doing of the public and what does it, what does the hobby bring, Neil? 
Yeah, I think, and I want to I want to refer back to uh, Tom and Nikki as well. What it does is that we all know about <clears throat> what America and Britain done during the war, but with with Tom's aspect and the, the actual Soviet commitment to it, you know, the Russians and actually let's face it, three quarters of German armed strength was faced up against the Soviets. Um, so uh, they were draining them. They were draining German armed power that could have could have been you know, facing the Allies. But the other aspect is what Nikki's discovered. The war wasn't just about the man on the front line. It was also about the things that went on to make sure that man could stay on the front line. You know, and that's part of the aspect of what we do. We, we're trying to say, OK, yeah, uh, Italy has always been kind of the joke of World War II um, history. And actually, we, uh, in World War II reenactment, but Italy contributed. Italy was on the bad side. You know, it, it was an Axis power. We are the baddies. Uh, yeah, we're the baddies. Um, and just, just, just for Nikki's sake, we, we, we're going to hold these up just so she knows the difference. OK. Um, and she's known us for years. Um, years. 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 But <laughs> the whole point is, is that um, this is where, it, where sort of like historical recreation events have a uh, benefit it's it's about information it's about actually it's not just about uh, the, the war films with you know robert mitchum and sean connery landing on d-day and um and taking you know in the longest day taking the, the objectives it's about actually the wider aspect of it it's not you know there's there's the north african campaign there's the russian campaign there's the home front. There's what the girls were doing back home, you know, in order to keep the men online. And that's where it has a benefit because that's not something that they talk about. They will talk about the Battle of Britain. They will talk about Overlord. And that's the thing that we're inundated with, you know, and I'm sure in America, things like Pearl Harbor. And um, I'm not completely au fait with American uh, education system, you know, but I'm sure Pearl Harbor is in there. I'm sure Overlord's in there. But it, it has to be that there's so many aspects of it. And the reason we, that we, we sit on the victorious side is because there was other efforts. And that's where I think that what we do is a benefit. It's, it's about education. It's about broadening people's minds, about broadening, you know, and 90% and of it, you know, if we're all honest, is about getting people, luring people in and saying, yeah. Come and do what we do, you know, uh, please, because you know, as reenactors, we we have a we we kind of have an aspect that numbers make make the group. But what I've learned in my time is, is that smaller is better, you know, smaller is beautiful and better quality. Mm. So with niche subjects such as Italian, and in a way, I mean, Russians certainly more has more input in the world war ii scene than than italian um but it's kind of it's 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 it's, it's allowing that educational side of things yeah. that's where i well, think let's let's bring thomas in there because thomas had a really good point that he put on the chat there about about the uh, the doing it for the veterans so that's say your point there because that was a doozy that was that was good yeah if people were doing it for the veterans like they claim they'd sell all their kit for many hundreds thousands of pounds whatever and they donate the funds to the RBL, but they don't. So there's another motivation there. And trying to justify the entirety of it by saying, I do it for the veterans, you, you don't. It's you know, you wouldn't do it if it was just for somebody else. You don't live vicariously through them. There's well, no point. The, yeah. I and mean, I'm glad you're honest, because I'm glad you guys said that, because that's you know, that is if you didn't enjoy it once. I mean, Nelly wanted to make a point as well. Um, so uh, yeah, um, Yeah, yeah, just listen to you guys. It, it, it's it's very true. Like, um, the saying about going to loads of events. Um, we, oh God, about seven years ago, we we were guilty for that. We, you know, every event on the calendar we would go to. But then basically got to the point of, as, as you guys said, you know, what is the point in this? We, we would sit there, we would get, would moan because things on other event, um, on other displays wouldn't be accurate. So we started slimming it down. Um, so sometimes we do events and there's just, 
um, us guys uh, sweating out the mission and some of our friends, some of the public come along, but they're there for the museum. So we've really slimmed it down as well. And I, and I agree, um, you know, it's, it's kind of for yourself, especially the evenings, as you said about being in certain areas, um, as, as we kind of do the Air Force events and we're on the air bases, we, we do find it fascinating to go around, find the old buildings, find out more of the history for it. Um, but when you're saying um, when you're saying about displays and different things, I I don't know. I think as a female, I found it easier to focus on on like smaller sections. So um, each year we try and do something different. Unfortunately, nothing this year. But a couple of years back, we we looked at recruitment. So for the WAC, so we had again more living history side. So we had a display set up, and then when the public came round, I I kind of spoke to them like they were joining up and what they would um you know the the age maybe their the weight what they were kind of expected to, to to be like and then um we we did a bit of a fun thing at the end and got them to wear the hats and different things but i think like you know like just getting that true information out but again with the public it, it's nice to educate them but they are there as you said they they are there for a lovely day out you know they're there to see some you know some different different um scenery um, um, but but they're also there to get their money's worth as well. So that mm. it is hard at, at certain events. Um, but I think, I don't know what you guys think, I think we are also there for some of the reenactors. We we are kind of, how can I put it? Um, you know, there are people coming in that, that are starting out and that there's almost like um, a role model for someone to be there, for them to, to help them as well. I don't know what you guys think on that, but... You know, it, it, yeah. Sorry, you go on. Go on, finish what you can see. No, no, I was just saying, you know, I'm not, I don't want to sound big headed or anything, but sometimes you are there. If you are doing it right, it is nice for people to go, can you help me? And that's what I think we are there for with our experience as well. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you, Nelly. Rather embarrassingly, I've had people say, I saw you in a magazine years ago and we saw pictures of you in a magazine and you had your old kit and, and that's what I thought I'd like to do um, and it, yeah I think the gang that we've got here represents the um, reenactors who may be slightly longer in the tooth than we care to admit but we do I've heard that Neil <laughs> yeah. yeah speak for yourself um, and we, I do think we have a responsibility to, to bring people along into the hobby, I will. Look, I think we're lucky in in this country. There's a, a small group of younger reenactors coming through that I've watched and met, <coughs> um, but they're doing it fantastically. Outstanding, Colin. Some of it's outstanding. I mean, <coughs> if you if you look back, and if I look back to the days that I started, and then I was, I you know, I used to love Bridge Too Far, and uh, I was interested in the border regiment they were in uh, Arnhem and all that sort of stuff that ended up in first airborne reconnaissance squadron. But then I was like, well, actually, you know, you know, <laughs> British infantry were at the heart of it all. My stuff's all been about practical stuff, wearing the gear, yeah. the, but there's, there's, there's a whole vintage scene. It's a whole vintage scene. And my God, some of these guys do it so well. Um, the, the standards of some of their stuff, and the attention to detail puts the scene 20, 25 years ago to shame. I mean, admittedly, there have been some people who were doing a top end then. And, you know, there have been people doing Falschmega in original Falschmega kit, like original Falschmega boots and smock and helmet. And I had an original smock denizen and original helmet and all that sort of stuff. You can forget all that because there's people doing it now to a much higher standard. And it's not only that, it's their knowledge, it's their drive and their interest. And if I have at ever stayed, at any stage, any stage, um, helped to uh, engender interest in it with a person in any way, shape or form, I'd be proud of myself in that regard. Mm. Um, but, it's like standards are like toothbrushes, aren't they? Everyone's got one, but they wouldn't use anybody else's. And, and when it comes to World War II, living history reenactment, 
visual storytelling, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Everybody's got a different approach to it. And to, to be to be one size does not fit all. Mm. People approach from different angles. No. People want to do different events. And people want to do different things. And they'll they'll change from one thing to another. So they'll put all their energy into events for X amount of years. And then they'll get to the point that me and Greg got to where we're saying, well, actually, it was a civilian army. It wasn't a professional yeah. it, Actually, well, I think, they I mean, were exactly professional. Sessions, I mean, uh, I'm Neil said, made a good point earlier about it representing the aspect like the Women's Land Army and the Russians and what have you. And, and being and Colin, you said about going to age appropriate stuff. And I love your First World War veterans selling matches in World War II. That's very good. But the fact is, it isn't, that's not, the hobby is not portraying it that way because i mean in the british army in world war ii for every man at the front there were seven behind the american army was every man at the front there were 16 behind and when you go to a living history event there is not one paratrooper and infantryman and 16 support troops it's 16 paratroopers and one support troop so the the the, the hobby does not reflect the balance of a military uh yeah army in world war ii i mean i was i'm reading peter caddick adam's book today on on d-day for a show i've got tomorrow on gold beach and he covers everything he covers intelligence and air, aerial interpretation of photos and blah 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 blah. it's not a three quarters of the book about um, paratroopers so so historians i would argue are trying to cover everything but living historians and actors are are cherry picking the bit they want to do and it comes back that policing of the hobby because if someone wants to dress up as a 502nd or ranger or british commando there's nothing to stop them but how how and it, we're coming to the, the the latter question how does the hobby police itself how does the hobby try and take what it's learned and try and bring people together and say what image are we projecting to the public how can we make it better um that's that's what i'd like to see what what can be done to, to, to bring this, shake it all up and make some kind of rules, or is it impossible? Do you mind if I interject, Paul? Yeah, yeah sure. All right. Um, actually, the things... You've swapped places the... to annoy us now, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. just to confuse and Nikki. Sure. It's just simply for yeah, Nikki. Nick, Nikki's just had a brain hemorrhage now. <laughs> Nikki is on the floor now, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Um, no. What it is, it's actually... <clears throat> Being in it a long time and being um, doing the group and doing what we do, we've watched other groups around. And the one group for me that stands out is Die Soldaten, who are doing late war German. Now, there's a couple of great guys. But actually, when we look at the policing it, as as older reenactors, we've kind of like, you know, sort of given them a little bit of advice. We've we've loaned what few German bits we have because, you know, we've still got some from when we did it. But for me, you know, if you talk about policing, it's, it's groups like that, like Diesel Darton, who I believe, my personal opinion, is probably the best, best reenactment group in the country, in, in the UK. And certainly abroad, we've seen other groups such as uh, Grupo Nord in Sweden, and in the continent who have really high start and high standards. And from an Italian perspective, you know, um, Mediterranean is probably deemed one of the older groups. There's another group called the uh, Monte Giverno in America, who also have high standard and qualities. But we've also noticed in Italy, there's another group called uh, Italica uh, Storia. It's uh, Italica, Italica Vitkes. Vitkes, yeah. Who yeah, they're very good. <laughs> I have amazing standards, all right? There's, you know, and we're noticing that it's only in, in the UK, for me, I don't think the future's bleak. And policing-wise, I think that groups like, you know, like DSL Darton, Italica Virtus, and uh, Grupo Nord need to be encouraged and helped. And that's where we fall in as Old, as older reenactors or older living historians um, is to actually say the benefit of our trials and tribulations in in, in well, years gone by when we used to nice. be yeah, when we used to pick up let's, let's face <laughs> it you know original Zelt Barnes I can here's a story it's a, we had an American guy come over once and when we were doing German he said 
I've got some. Uh, no, it was the first year we did Italian. Yeah. He, he came over and he said, uh, are you guys interested in, in any German Zellbahns that we're reproducing? And we were like, okay, all right, let's have a look at them. He showed us them and said, yeah, yeah, they, they, they look pretty good. How much are you? He went, well, you know, currently they're £125. And we went, oh, sort of. We can get originals for 15 Wandered over to the first Belgian dealer at Beltring, and there it is. And he was like, it blew his mind, okay? So in the days when we could pick up original German equipment for what we would deem pence, um, you know, it's we've got to be able to like, help encourage this group. So policing it, perhaps we can just offer just little bits of advice. And it is, we had it kind of luckier because we had much more that we could tap into. I mean, as a German reenactor, I had an MP44, I had, you know, and it was all pre-96 DIAC. So we could buy these kind of things, you know, it's, it's for that kind of thing, for the, for the interesting stuff, it's, it's, it's easier. But for uniform wise, you know, we've got this wealth experience and policing it as older reenactors as experienced reenactors we can help police them because one of the um one of the things we used to go by is like if you can evidence it you can do it but the evidence had to be that it had to be about eight photographs of separate individuals wearing it you know you often see groups like you know it, Oh, you're referring to beards. Oh, beards. Well, beards in Italian is fine. But, <laughs> you know, we can wear beards whenever we want. However, when it comes to things like American style, you know, you know, let's face it, how many American paratroopers do you see with, with Mohicans and with war paint on? All right, you often see loads of American paratroopers dressed like that. I mean, and it was only a, a very small percentage as a, as a promo. So... Um, for me, as experienced reenactors, we can help police it by giving guidance to the younger guys. Not that Diesel Darton need it, but it's it's that it's just it's just helping them and saying and encouraging them through what we say. I don't think, to be quite honest, that to say the word police is not really a really a good way of actually like presenting it. No. I think what we should be doing is just advising. Um, when we were doing this back in like the 80s and 90s now, things like British equipment and that, you know, like BD and, you know, 37 pattern weapon and all, even the ammo boots, you could get for, you know, like on a relatively like comfortable budget. Um, now you can get repro stuff. Now, I think I think the, the stuff that's actually available in there, out in the market now is of higher quality. Um, but I think somewhere along the line of that, something in the message has been lost. Um, is that we're not actually like you know there's 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 still elements towards this hobby and uh, overlooked and um, for me personally and I actually think that in the 90s we were like sleeping in you know like in foxholes we have like you know uh, in the bird candles for warmth and there was a much more attention to detail back then which I think now may have been lost yeah uh, I think we've got I think people who want to enjoy Nikki, sorry to interrupt. Nikki wants to say something. I think. Absolutely fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Nikki, do you want to say something? Yeah, I was just, I was just going to say about Neil and Steve swapping over gear. Yeah, thanks for doing that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think the um, the whole issue about how people approach the hobby and and how they approach their their sort of entry into the hobby is is a really difficult thing to actually tackle um, because. For everything that everybody said so far, yes, it is completely. It's, it is a self-indulgent activity that we do, and um, and I always find it really hard when um, when I when I see things and I'm thinking, oh, that's 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 really not good. Um, but then I think, well, actually, what right do I have to say to people, you shouldn't be wearing that, you shouldn't be doing that, mm. that's, not, that's not appropriate. It's a really difficult thing to tackle, particularly because I think events have changed. So um, certainly the events that I used to take part in as a reenactor, um, we used to have very clear guidelines for how we were supposed to act. We Usually I found that we had some kind of um, 
written instructions um, if you were taking part in an event, uh, they would usually publish something like that. So you kind of could work your way through what you were going to do. Nowadays, the events are completely uh, like a free tool, um, and they are a lot wider and a lot bigger um, and very diluted. So, and there's lots more elements to most of the events that go on now, which is done to from a commercial angle to draw people in. Um, so I think it's very hard to do quality uh, living history reenactment at any of them. I, I find it, I've always found it really difficult to do land armies. Actually, there are very many opportunities to be able to set up a, a, um, an accurate um, portrayal, um, you know, because most of, the, most of the time the girls would have been out on a farm. Well, that, yeah. you know, Happen and I think that thing- brings that brings up that ultimate thing. Whatever you do, it's going to fail on some level. I mean, I'll let you talk again. I was at Chalk Valley History Festival last year, the event James Holland it organizes, and Taft Gillingham had supplied 35 or it was unit uniform Suffolk's uh first battalion Suffolk regiment for a modern uh, platoon of serving Royal Anglians. And they put them in the kit and they had one Sherman tank and they had and they did their demonstration across the field. And I was watching it and I was uh, and it was in some ways it was brilliant because they moved as one the, because they were serving military they're, they're, they they were fit there was no wheezing for a start when they moved across the field, you couldn't hear the coughing and the, but they looked but they like carried their guns guy. wrong didn't they that, yeah, they had the they had the they had the modern port arm stuff, and they and they moved like they looked like modern guys who put on a uniform ten minutes earlier because they were modern guys who put on a uniform ten minutes earlier. And although people were, there was a couple of reenactors there, and I was ended up helping trying to shake them down and get the anklets right and stuff. They still look like modern soldiers, but on the one hand they look really good, and on the other hand they failed. So if you'd got the Monty's men there, they'd have been older, they'd have been a bit more wheezing, but they'd have looked better in the kit. So ultimately. Whatever is done fails on some level if it, if it, if it wins on another level. That's the ultimate dilemma is how do you get this balance right between age and, and experience? And um... With Monty's men, though, Woody, I mean, we've got a much younger intake now. Yeah. We've, got, we, we've managed to harness the new generation, which, and, the, you know, at, at one stage, I didn't think there was going to be a new generation, you know. Star Trek and it. it's ridiculous. And that's but, that's good that it is carrying on. So it, you know, there is a new generation and they are um, and their attention is, you know, I, I think it depends. I, there's some other people who've spoken just earlier who said, Oh, well, you know, the attention to it is not the same. Actually, you know, in some of the things that I've encountered, the attention to it is outstanding. Um but that and, isn't a minority, Pete, if we're honest. It is. It is. It depends entirely on the events that you've taken part in and, and, and what you want and, and, and what you're gearing for. So with Monty's men, it's I'm like, very grateful come here and, you know, Sorry. this is what you've got to have or whatever. Sorry, Woody. Yeah, well, no, I'm very grateful that some of you are being honest about it because I had, I was at one point and I conceived this idea. I was going to have maybe someone coming on who is against, you know, actually stands against reenactment. And my, one of my World War II TV team, Duncan, who's ex-guards, doesn't get, and he's watching, I think, doesn't get reenactment, was wanted to come on and say, what the fuck is it all about? Why do you do it? And I didn't want to put him on because I think I didn't want to, you know, correct that. I thought I could do a, a good job of being kind of devil's advocate because I have seen it. You know, I've had one foot in both camp. I have been a reenactor, living historian, and now I'm not. And I still see there's some, there's a kernel of something there that is really good. And yet I see so much, and I do admit it's because I live in Normandy that, you know, I, I've seen so I have to, I keep stating it, but I've, you, those who follow me on Facebook know how much shit I've seen over the last few years and how I'm still not here. still here. I don't know, because I don't know how I haven't just uh, jumped off. We've a cliff, all right, seen right. a lot. We, but, you know, to be, if we're really, really, really honest, we've probably all seen more crap than we've seen good. And for those people who really want to do it well, part of the struggle is the rage against that machine, (laughs) you know, because you're like, well, you know, this needs to be portrayed properly. That needs to be done right. So so where does the hobby go? What's the, what's the next step? Because we know we're not an hour and a half. What, what, how does, is there a need for living history? Yeah. To, to to kind of go down to Winchester and wait till it blows over. (laughs) Have a a nice bar, pick up mum, go down to Winchester. Yeah. I mean, the point is, the public are a bit 
sometimes a bit mis misunderstanding what reenactment the living history is all about. What can the hobby do to kind of rebrand itself, if you like? Greg? Okay. Yeah. Then we'll go to Nelly. Sorry, hang on. We'll do so Greg Evan, first. Just um, potentially a radical thought here, but I don't care about the public. Why right, does okay. there have to be a public component to this? In all honesty. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's a good, that's a valid point. Yeah. You know, lots of us do this because we want to challenge ourselves. We want to learn. We want to, you know, the thrill of the chase of getting exotic bits of kit and all that sort of stuff. You know, that's all great. I don't care if a member of the public sees that. In reality, because we're all show offs because we do this. And if any of us say we're not, we're lying to ourselves. I want to say my unit is great. It looks good. It's got all the right kit. OK, we've got some fat, wheezy blokes. But you know what? Who are we to say? I've what left, hobby? Greg. I'm not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't wheezy. You were just fat. Just fat, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so why does it matter about the public? Why can't this but hobby just be about the, it, you know, why don't we internalise the hobby? Why do we worry about what people that are disinterested think? Because okay, but they then are not interested. When we finish this, if we go on Google and those watching this and we look for websites of living history enactment groups, I would bet money that on the first page of three quarters of the first 10 websites, we would say within the first sentence, it will say we're doing this to educate the public and we're doing it to honor veterans. I mean, it. And it, how it, honest a statement is that? Sorry, it, it, it might be on the web page. Yeah, exactly. So if it's on how much of an honest statement is that? That's my point. If, if a living history, I think I don't know Nelly and Vinnie as well. And Jared, I know from a history context rather than reenactment as such. But I, I admire the, the honesty of Monty's men and, and the khaki chum and saying we're not doing it for the public. You know, we're doing it for us. So that's fine. That then 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 say that. Then, then say that. Why, why, why did the public? Yeah, I agree with you, Greg. Why did the public have to come in? Why do when they get interviewed on camera here? And I've seen it. I've seen TV crews going over to reenactors and saying, "Why are you here?" And they say they're doing it to honor the veterans. And I always want to go up and say, "If you're going to do it honor the veterans, you'd be coming with a wreath and you'd be taking your wreath to the cemetery, putting it on an unknown soldier, and buying the veteran who's over there in a wheelchair a beer and a next meal at the pub. That's what you'd be doing." If, which is Thomas's point, reworded from earlier. So it, it you know. is. But the, 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 and the other aspect, so what, what I'm saying, if we internalise the hobby and um, we'll understand ourselves a lot better, that's not to say we should exclude conversations with people because the inevitability is that given the commercial reality of reenactment in the UK, and I can't speak about Germany and America and places and France, you are going to go to a show. Nine times out of ten, you are not going to be paid to go to that show because the show organizer knows full well that you're quite keen to disport yourself in public for free but when you do that that's when it comes to the education that you must have and have built up within your group to have the proper conversation the proper educational content and the wider contextual understanding of world war ii be it the there's one guy and there's seven behind and there's 30 behind that and 50 behind that mm. we need to have that conversation the reality is People don't want to do shithouse diggers for the Pioneer Corps because it's not attractive. People wouldn't be interested in it. That's true. That's well, a very no, good point. To a, to a degree, uh, the, the possibility there is. Uh, whoever's been at the show and polished their boots uh, and had people watch them polishing their boots, getting the kit ready, there's a different angle there. I did toy with the idea of doing Pioneer Corps when I started becoming too old. Um, but let's wind this back a bit when I started yes you could go to a surplus store and you could pick up whatever you wanted and part of the thrill was the chase of going well I found this hat I need to find the battle dress that goes with it and build it up now if I've got a credit card I can go to um, <clears throat> stores and um, and become mm. five or first saving private Ryan's uh, is that any less valid than what I was doing if there's a a, an inroad into it should you promote that yes we can be insular and just do it for our enjoyment or our edu self-education but equally we have to take people in to the hobby to build the hobby up and one thing I'd be interested in because this is quite British centric 
and we know that there are um, railway dues, which you either love or hate, um, and promenaders and 40s swing dancers and whatever. And the Daily Mail will see those railway shows and take a picture of the English eccentric dressed as the fat German. Mm -hmm. well, how is reenactment viewed over the other side of the pond? Does it have that same wacky well, let's, eccentricity? Let's bring Jared in. Let's bring Jared. How is it viewed on your side of the pond? Because we are particularly UK centric here. What, what, you know, and you're, you're in the East Coast, but you know, you're, you're in history, you know, <laughs> civil war, revolutionary, everything is within a you know, hundred miles of yeah. where you live. So how is it viewed where you are? Yeah, you know, and I'm going to push back a little bit and, and say that the public is not disinterested. Um, my group, the Furious Fourth, we did 18 events last year, coinciding with 75th anniversary commemorations and such. Maybe it's some sort of cultural divide that I'm not aware of. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the majority of our events were at historic sites, museums, and national parks. And if the public sees us as a form of entertainment, I don't think that is necessarily a bad thing either. Um, but I think in so many ways, the living historians serve as a bridge uh, to the general public and people can interact with the past in a way that they cannot do in a traditional classroom or a textbook. Uh, and, you know, and we have interact, we interacted with thousands upon thousands of people uh, last year who I like to think we had some sort of meaningful conversation with. And, you know, really the basis for what consists of a good living history group, the foundation for all of that is research. Mm -hmm. uh, research, constantly finding new information, uh, sharpening your presentation skills. Um, a fair number of members in my group have uh, history degrees, you know, uh, they certainly aren't amateurs, not in my view. Um, uh, some of them have written books, they've written articles, uh, some of them are teachers or aspiring teachers. And, you know, I, th there are many venues in which people can learn history. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in my view, I almost think it's almost a waste not to share all of this money and talent and research with the masses. That makes sense. I mean, we've, we've got some comments coming and we should hear more from the women. So we've got, and yeah. someone said there's only one woman. I thought, well, there's two. So, uh, so because theoretically, and I'm gonna put this to Nikki and Nelly, there's, it's more realistic for a female to be correctly presenting history because they were non-combatant generally so you are presenting something that is is easier to demonstrate in a living history context whereas you know when you talk about invasions and ag army groups and agras and, and and naval support it's hard to recreate that but the women's land army you can literally get behind a horse and a plow and demonstrate exactly what they did completely authentically so so you have less excuse to get it wrong in a sense because you're non-combatant in that way so what's your feeling about this, you know, what does it bring? Uh, I'll bring Nelly in. Nelly hasn't talked as much as you have, Nikki, because I, I, I've known. Uh, let's bring Nelly in. So, you know, right. the, the female aspect, you've got more. Yeah, what, on my point there, you've got m more reason to get it across. And what you said about the recruiting and telling people what they would face if they joined the WAG, that's very interesting to me. So, you know, you, you yeah, I'll, I'll shut up and let you talk. Yeah. <laughs> so I was rambling there. No, no, no that's fine. Right, get, going back to your, right, I'm going to go back to the point that you guys are making, what, what steps could we make forward? Um, every year I go to Hastings. Um, um, one of my really good friends, her husband, um, he is in the bike, and they've got a really good system going um, on how, you know, how, how they kind of link their society together. And then those reenactors are then invited to a certain event, which I really like. But then on the other hand, you know why why can't everyone do it so i did just thought i'd put that to you because if you if you're interested you might not want to go down that route why should you be told so it, yeah it's difficult um i get ugh, what, what i think i don't know about you guys you, you have your you know like you said about the paratrooper and they're not you know they've got the the beard they're overweight and whatever now i think what my ugh, biggest bugbear really is with with the whole kind of World War II thing sometimes. So, you know, you go to an event, say like, go say a railway event, 
and you, you get the members of the public and I do feel sorry for them sometimes because they turn up they they go and wear what they think is correct and um, true because they're going there to have a lovely day they're, they're going there to to enjoy it um I think my thing is now social media is great but then you get Facebook and you get those photographers and and that that poor person is then you know had a photograph taken put on Facebook they've seen a, a, another few events and they're slated um so I, I do find that difficult um you know well, that's either, interesting as well because there is that far those there's various fab fest websites and Facebook groups which I have yeah, a laugh yeah, and a yeah. giggle at there isn't a celebration of good living history group. There is not an equivalent where people say, here's something that's really brilliant. Let's look at that. We, the, the hobby yeah. seems better at laughing at itself or yeah, laughing yeah. at the poorer members of it than it is celebrating what's been happening at the, uh, the top end. So, I mean, Nicky, you want, I think you wanted to make a point, Nikki, didn't you? So, Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I, I completely uh, understand where Nelly is coming from. And I completely agree with what she's saying because it is really difficult. But it, it's also, um, it, it's really hard to actually contend with social media now. Um, we never had that when, when, when I did live in history and stuff. We, we, you know, the internet thing wasn't a thing because I am ancient. Um, and so there's a whole different, we're working in a completely different world now. And where everybody can have an opinion on something immediately um, and I found I um, I started off by trying to always on, on any of the like on the social media sites, if something was um, if someone put a picture up of something and said, you know, what do people think about this? How can I improve this? What do you think about my, you know, impression? Um, and I would give honest feedback, but then I've stopped doing that now because actually for every honest comment that I would make and say, you might like to think about doing this because actually that wouldn't have been worn in that circumstance. And, you know, and, and so I tried to do all that. You then get absolutely bombarded. Yeah, you get with, stitched, don't you? And a stitch Nazi and, and, and the watchword will come. Oh, well, of course, people just do it to have fun. And it's like, well, I do my hobby to have fun. But actually, if you're wearing a uniform, whatever that uniform is, you are representing somebody that actually served. And I don't think that makes any difference whether it's a military uniform or a, a civilian, you know, home front uniform. Those people are still signed up to do something. And I think we owe it to them to do it correctly. So I, I now don't make those kind of comments anymore. Um, I do find it really difficult because I have to eat my fist sometimes. So I'm like, ah! so, you know, but, but it's a really difficult subject because everybody can be an expert and everybody can click on Google and see an image and then go, I'm going to dress that. I'm going to. Do, I'm going to wear that. I'm going to get that. You know, that's obviously what they did. I mean, it, 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 as an example, if you were to Google women's land army land girls, um, the images that would come up would quite honestly make your hair fall out. Quite honestly, and there are there are no really decent images of people wearing uni or women wearing uniforms as it should be worn. You know, yeah. and I and I I struggle with that content every day. I am. Um sorry to chip in I, I i agree with you because i have in the past tried to help people um they've asked how they you know how they look how can they improve it and you've told them and i don't know how the men find this but the women can take it the completely opposite way and and then think you are being awful um you are not helping you you know your class is a bully but you're only there trying to guide them and they've asked for your help so i've yeah I, i've got to the point now sometimes and i just just leave it and it is it is frustrating i mean my motivation for doing this and partly because i'm very interested right at the moment in what i call cross pollination is bringing the different worlds together so i've done shows on tank cases where i brought in people from the video gaming world as well as people who've driven tanks and i think uh, bringing in historians and reenactors and living historians and filmmakers and museums and having them all work together is is a good way of 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 pushing me and jared for example is a bit of everything you know you're like me a man of many hats you're a writer a history teacher a reenactor a filmmaker and probably something else i've forgotten about and i think that that when you've seen it from different worlds i think that's when maybe you can see some potential um improvements to the hobby by bringing these worlds together and uh 
and and having historians respect reenactment and reenactment respect historians and what have you. But I mean, I've got some historian friends who absolutely. They, I mean, I got messages saying you shouldn't be doing this show. I said, you know, you're, you're giving kind of giving voice to idiots, basically. I said, well, some of them are idiots, but they're my friends. But no, I mean, but they didn't want me to do this. They didn't think it was a serious enough subject. And, I, and I'm like, well, fuck you. It's a, it is a subject because it is a portrayal of history. Whether it's done badly or or well, it is still a presentation of history. And I think it deserves to be talked about. And I, this is, to my knowledge, the first serious discussion anyone's ever had about this. I yeah, think I think one of the problems with it is Woody that is is that if you look at the period of, of history that we're portraying, it, 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 it if you look at classic reenactment, you know, American Civil War. If you're looking at Vikings or Romans or whatever else, you know, to a lot of people now, that's ancient history. And to the current young generation now, that's ancient history. Second World War is ancient history. It's only 70 something years ago, but to them, it's ancient history. And we've crossed a bridge over the last 20, 25 years from tacit knowledge. And there was a lot of it. When I started, there were veterans everywhere. And yeah. were national yeah. servicemen, all right, they hadn't fought yeah. in the war, but they all knew how to wear the uniform. You know, they all knew how to blank all equipment. Yeah, all blanco, that sort of stuff. boot polish, all that stuff. All, all that, that sort of stuff. But, uh, you know, all right, they lived in a thing where they all this rubbish about you can't put your hands in your pockets. I mean, what <clears throat> rubbish. But let, let you know, I'm talking national service. You, you never put your hands in your pockets. Well, why do you have pockets then? Oh, but it, quite, quite it, that aside, there was a lot of tacit knowledge and that tacit knowledge is reducing over time and it's it were right at the end of the wedge now and you've got entire generations of people who haven't got any idea they 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 haven't read commando books they haven't mm. read victor comics battles they they've compl- and, and that's only that's not very long but may, maybe so that's we've... gonna come back you know greg made that point earlier about the, when the BRA changed the LHA, they wanted to be taken seriously, like the the uh, Ermin Street Guard and the English Civil. Maybe World War Two reenactment started too early, and it'd be better if it had waited not till a hundred years after the conflict and started then, and maybe it yeah, had no, been taken more seriously. I mean, the first World War probably now, but maybe the, the best war, theory is ahead. The first war reenactors, you know, probably went to that a bit earlier than we did. There's people now doing like 1980s Northern Ireland. There's people doing yeah, Vietnam, which I think is very weird. Yeah, you know <laughs> Vietnam. There's people doing all that sort of stuff, and you know if that's their interest, you know that's fine. And you know Vietnam's got, captured public imagination all over the world, and it, it, it's it's an, an incredibly interesting part of history. Yeah. You know? All influenced we're, we're, we're by coming stuff, to the point where we're and everything else. We're going to be Sorry, coming up on. to two hours soon. I kind of thought about an hour and I'm a half. I'm going to have to go we, soon. We, we will stop <laughs> it at two. We'll, 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 we'll wind things up. I, I, I'm Firstly, I want to thank you all for coming on and being honest about the fact that some of the pretensions, pretensions about the hobby and pretending we, that it's done for this reason is actually just because you enjoy it. And I think that's good. And I, and I like the fact we've had this platform and, I, and I'd and i like to think it will be seen by some people who perhaps don't understand it. Mag, my other half, doesn't understand. She met the Monty's men June the 6th, whatever year that was, down in the Falaise Gap. And she started off thinking you were weird and then she still thinks you're weird, but she quite likes you now. So that's 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 the improvement of some, of some sort. So, you know, but I think there's an avenue to explore with more of these kind of shows and going down some different parts and specifically looking at the, we haven't talked about the portrayal of, of Axis. You know, you mentioned Neil and Steve earlier on about you didn't fancy the idea of wearing German. I'd like to explore that on a greater level. And, and Vinnie, I could bring, could bring in about how uh, German reenactment is seen in Germany. And that's another whole rabbit hole we could go down a future show. But I do, I do like the fact you've all been very honest about what this hobby is. And, and I think it definitely has got an identity problem in terms of how the public see it. And I think it, it is because, as one of you, several of you said, it is a multifaceted hobby. And we've, we haven't even touched on the people who live the 1940s lifestyle. There are people we know, I mean, who, who are completely everything is from the moment. I mean, I never did that. I, as soon as I came home, my kit went in the cupboard and it was back to, you know, watching TV. And that, that was never. But there are people who do that. And uh, that that's another. Is that living history or is that? I don't know. That's another strand to go down. But Paul, Paul, can I just say something to Nikki? You can. Have you swapped positions again? No. 
No, no, we haven't. <laughs> Barrow. We all Barrow. Barrow. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, Nicky knows. Him. So, you know, but, but before you bring it, has anyone got any points they'd like to make? Because, I mean, there are going to be people watching this, uh, believe it or not. I think the numbers have dropped off. I've a little got bit recently one point. Really. About what, what would they like to say to people who don't understand the hobby at all? So, Nelly put a hand up there. So, you know, what message have you got for the, the, the great pu public out there? I think, um, to get, right, this is got, kind of going slightly back, but, you know, we, we all have reasons why we do this. And, we, we all have a passion to why we do it. We all want to be authentic. We all want to get it completely right with our hours of research. But then I think sometimes we need to take a chill pill ourselves. And, and like the other guys have done, sometimes it's best to do an event by yourself in a field. You're enjoying it for your sake because you're learning a bit more about the history about it. But there, and again, like you said about the public, there are some public that come along. They, they've come along for a lovely day out to, to have their um, 1940s tea and their biscuits and whatever. So, yeah, I, I think we all need to sometimes just lay back and think, right, we're going to that event. We, we are there because we are with our friends. And, and I think yeah. if you're the wrong group, there's no point in going to an event. Is there? There's no point in us spending hundreds and thousands on, on kit to not be with that nice group of people. And I think sometimes being with that group of people at a really crappy event Sometimes it, it can be great, you know, because you learn so much more about each other and you have a great time. Uh -oh. mm. So, I, 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 you know, that, that's my view of that. And I think, you know, whatever the public take from it, hopefully, just hopefully, especially from like a woman's point of view, they, they can, you know, they can see that they, they didn't all have victory waves. They, they can see how different things, you know, their clothes they wore. Hopefully they'll take something small away, a small fact, and they've had a lovely day. And we've taken away our, you know, we've had a lovely weekend with our friends and we've learned some more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's, yeah. You know, I, I, you know what, that, that pretty much sums it up in a nutshell, really, yeah. for me, it because does, it? agreed. It is agreed. It is. I mean, I mean I'm, 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 a tour, I'm a tour guide now and YouTuber, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, all my tour, tour guide friends, all our, ever, our aim ever is is to make people know a little bit more about D-Day at the end of the tour than they started with. Now, maybe they knew nothing and you can just about just about let them know that the commanding officer was Eisenhower and that's the one thing they'll take away. Well, great, that's that one thing they didn't know. Sometimes you can go even further. You push it, you you take them beyond where they can. And I suppose that in its, in its heart, living history has the opportunity to take people from knowing very little about it to at least after seeing it, understanding, well, hang on, those uniforms looked itchy or they cooked on petrol cookers or, or whatever. So it, it's a start, isn't it? Like even the crappy war films, people do pick up books when they've seen a crappy war film. So has anybody got any other point they want to make about, you know, message across the... Nikki? Yeah, yeah, if you don't just, mind. Okay, Nikki, then Neil. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, in, in answer to that question, when I, when I was thinking about... Um, when, when we're talking about... Like, yeah, what is this hobby about? I, the, the advice that I, I do give to people, and um, particularly when they're looking at a uniform, is don't be tempted to go for the highest rank possible keep it simple and then I say to people actually take your time um, to think about what you want to what you want to portray keep your keep your portrayal simple that you feel comfortable with that you can carry around with you that you haven't got to worry about if somebody asks you something that you don't know do a little bit of background research enough to be able to carry you through a situation and talk about it as much as you can practice it as much as you can use it as much as you can because the more you use those um the, the little bits of knowledge that you have in your brain the more the, the, the easier that they come out when you're talking to people and um don't ever go to one place to do research go go across the board talk to people look in multiple re resources to be able to develop what you want to actually portray because there's never one version of something there's yeah. always alternative versions of it I mean, Duncan, who is my who is my my hater of reenactment, has just made a comment that he he says you've all come across very well tonight. He, even Colin was like, I think no, but he says you still get the weirdos in Norman who come up and just dressing it up all about the kit. But that's going to happen anyway, isn't it? That is that's going to there are going to be idiots turning up to Normandy as long as these companies still churn out these cheap reenactment gear. That's going to keep on happening. So what do we want? Do we want the, to the top living history to give up because most of it's shit? No, we want the top living history to carry on and hopefully 
the people further down the rung will be a, a, a inspired to move up the rung slightly and improve their their knowledge, they improve their their historical appreciation, improve their uniforms, and so on. I mean, I, we we don't want to see the, the 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 good hobby end, but you know, I, I I yeah, Greg wants to make another point, and then we'll then we'll bring things to an end. And, no, it's it's and just Neil, very quick one. Very quick one going back to what you just said, Willie. One of the founding principles of Monty's men when we started was anybody can come along. Anybody can come along, but you just have to abide by our kit rules. And the idea behind that was we get guys from disparate groups come onto Monty's men. Ideally, we think we'd had a really high kit standard, high authenticity. And then by coming onto our trip, then going back to your unit, you'll be able to influence the guys in your unit to raise their game. And yeah. eventually the theory was that the natural level of British World War II infantry reenacting would rise purely because guys had come on the trips and gone back and, and built the stuff up because you're only going to influence an increase in standards within your own group through your own leadership. There's, there's nobody that can make you be better in authenticity. You have to want to do it yourselves. Yeah, that's true. Well, well I and, think Neil's got his point. To and, they challenge yeah, you, don't, and they challenge you and they bring, they bring, they bring their own standards to you. Yeah. So, the one thing I've learned with Monty's men was early days we were up here and then some of the other lads were down here. And then over time, you know, some of the other lads are coming in up here and they're saying, why aren't you doing this? And, and that's completely valid. And if you stop learning and if you think you're good and if you think you're good enough, it, you know, that's when you fail. And you've got you've got some lads coming in with some really high standards, really high standards coming in saying we should be doing this, we should be doing that. And you're like, well, actually, I can't argue with that. So we're going to change the uniform regs. So the uniform regulations change and they get better and they push you. And the minute, the minute you think you're above everybody else, the minute you failed. And the minute you can't listen to anybody else, it's the minute you failed, you know, about whether it's about blank or colour or this or that or that, you know, without going into things that the public do not give a toss about because they don't know, you know, the, the kind of things that Nelly said, you know, we know things to such detail. The public are never, ever going to be interested in that, ever. But if they just take away just something little about, I don't know, other ranks didn't wear collars and it was all itchy wool and everybody was... You know, but everybody was acclimatized to it, and they were probably the best boots they ever got, and all that sort of stuff. It, 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 it's, it's only seventy something years ago. Things have changed so much in seventy years. Um, yeah. You know. I, mean, I think I think there's rabbiting. although there are some reenactors who could definitely learn from historians, there are definitely historians who could learn from reenactors. I read books by people who get their history perfect in terms of which unit moved across which field at which time and attacked which objective. But their description, which they're just putting in as color of the gear is all over the place because they've never actually looked at a pair of battle just trousers or they've never looked at a backpack and, they've, and, they, and they use the wrong, you know, wrong terminology. And that just drives me crazy. And I think if historians went and spent a day putting battle dress on or American M43s and whatever on and just spent a day in it, they'd be able to write about it better. Because they would just have a bit more sense of how difficult it is to move when you're carrying a Vickers machine gun over your back, or as Rich Fisher a Vickers K from from Sword Beach to Pegasus Bridge and failing halfway. Because, but Neil wanted to make a point, and then we'll bring it to an end. Otherwise, we'll, we'll go on forever. So, Neil, you wanted to say something. Actually, I'm going to say something now. So, it's Steve, is this, um, is, this, is this deep now? Is it? Yeah, yeah, it is. We haven't swapped places again. Something deep now. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to I'm, I'm going to put my own summary onto it and that. Yeah, Steve. Uh, my own summary about this is like, you know, when you look at this hobby and that, it's a lot of it is like, for me personally, and that it's about escapism. Um, but it's also a passion as well about learning something about a period of time that we were not involved in. Uh, but we, you know, for a lot of us, we actually heard firsthand from people who actually experienced it. So for me, it's, it's kind of a case of like educating not only the public, but also ourselves, um, because that's something we never had to experience now. I mean, we're going through rather, you know, rather difficult times ourselves at the moment now, and we're all having a new form of education. I mean, this is something that you'll be expressing to your grandchildren in the future, now you're, you're through the COVID times. But it's it's one of those, it's one of those things. And I think it's like, you know, it's for me, it's just a case of just 
taking something which I wasn't a part of, but something that was actually part of my life with my grandparents. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Cat knocked over the computer. That's the wine gone. <laughs> <laughs> but I have beer. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, basically, and I'll, I'll summarise quickly. Um, uh, you didn't smash a glass on that, but yeah, it's um, it was it was for me, and that is literally. I think we all we may, may all we're all victims of this. I think, and that is that we actually like it's the same as like people going to a football match, it's the same as people like like painting like models, it's the same as anybody doing like photography or going to the gym. It's a it's a passion. It mm. is a passion, but it's just a very weird one. I think. I think we can't really end it with a better comment than that. It's a passion, but it's a very weird one. That should be the tagline of oh, no. groups. It is a passion, but it's a weird one. That's I think that sums it all up. So, well, I think we'll, we'll I mean, Thomas, did you, you haven't said anything for a while. Do you, do you have any closing marks? Because what you did say was really good. So anything you wanted to add, then we'll bring things to an end. My wine! Shut that. it, shut it, Neil. <laughs> I've muted him. Um. Really, for me, it's it's about the conversations I have with public and not not um, internalizing things and not doing it for myself. Uh, I just want to engage with people, and I think if people did that a little bit more, the hobby would be a little bit better. But it's my personal view. I think that, that that's very valid, and I mean, I so in my days, I found it easier to engage the public hiding behind the mask of a uniform than I did if I was just there as myself. Now I'm okay doing it as myself now, but. But back then, it was easy to kind of pretend I was somebody else a bit and explain about what they did that I wouldn't I wouldn't have found that voice if I hadn't been hiding amongst a, a blob of khaki. But well, anyway, I think well, well, thank you very much for joining us. Anyone else want to closing remarks about anything, or shall we bring it to? You? Otherwise, we're gonna people are gonna be deeping off cliffs soon. I think just one thing from me. Just I agree with Tom really. I mean, it, there's it there, there's a lot to be gained from interaction with the public, and I've done a lot of that over the last 20 odd years. I think it just got to a point, and I think Greg and I have spoken from the viewpoint of Monty's men, where we thought, right, well, actually, now we're going to do it for us. Um, and any viewpoints that we've expressed in that regard, I think we've, we're expressing from the point where we said, well, we've done public shows, we've done shows, we've done, we've done stand for the public. Um, and I mean, actually, Greg's, I know fine well Greg's still doing them. I'm still doing them um, on the BEF side of things with a different group. When it comes to Monty's men, we're doing it from the point of actually, let's let's do this for ourselves. And, and only in the last year or two, that's shrunk down to being UK based only and not good with France to all communities. But I agree, there's a lot to be gained from interaction. Um, and just sharing a little bit and in what's been said earlier and, and I think Nelly encapsulated it precisely even if they take away just a small amount of what you've said mm. um, and they learn yeah <clears throat> no, I, I definitely want to use reenactors. I am going to. I mean, I've, I've got Dickie Townsie coming on doing about a regimental aid post. I've got um, I want to bring Ramsey on at some point on about rations. I definitely think the, the best reenactors can offer as much to the understanding of history in a specific field as, as your pedicatic Adams and your people who write 25 books. In what they know, they know that as well as people who write about history. So I think I mean, I'm going to keep on using people from different walks of life in my shows, and I will be using reenactors, living historians, because I think they have something to offer. But we will knock it on ahead. There's, there's people actually saying we've had quite a... I think they've been actually watching this. Say, great discussion. Enjoyed all of that. I that's that they're amazing. They're just most mostly our husbands and girlfriends and wives and things. Uh, Nick is watching Nicky, so he's not all of them at the same time. Not all of them, yes. <laughs> anyway, so in terms of myself and what we're doing, we've got a uh, um, a stream from Gold Beach tomorrow afternoon, four p.m. UK time, French time. We're doing Jig Green Two Three One Brigade pushing and land to point fifty four, which is the one. If ever you saw the old Time Team special the years ago, we're doing that again. And then I've got various other shows next week. Um, in terms of today, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. I did you all get something out of it in, in, a, in a bizarre kind of way? 
Oh, yeah. um, and and Colin's got me sherbet lemons, which is a fantastic bit. So yeah, I think there's definitely. I'll, I'll repeat myself. There's definitely potential doing some some something with you again, and and going down to some more routes and bringing bringing people in from other fields of things. But I admire your honesty. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, I'm going to end the stream now. And don't forget, you can see more discussions on World War Two TV. And I'm Paul Woodard saying I'm going to go and have a beer. So thank you very much. Cheers then. Bye bye bye. bye. <laughs>